Thank you. I guess I, I may assume I have half an hour, but I will try to finish, certainly not later than that, but I will not be able to do it in 20 minutes. So this is uh, <coughs> based on joint work with uh, Stefan Pessy, Phil Jackson, and Matthias Cassell, who uh, is here. So it's an anti-strong diagraph, so what on, what on earth would that be, I mean, what, what do I mean by this? So we're looking at uh, things like, like here, we have anti-directed paths, so uh, this is about as far as you can come from being strong as possible. You, you don't even have a directed path to length two, but we are interested in paths like this. So we, would, uh, we could have some motivation, namely, can we say anything about joining vertices by this kind of path uh, and say anything about, define some kind of connectivity based on this? Uh, the problem is that uh, even to decide whether there's one such path is then P complete. So uh, a more, <coughs> A more natural way, I mean, a way that will work, is the following. So we define, uh, uh, we look at what we call a forward anti-directed path, trail, so it's allowed to uh, intersect itself like this, but I still have, you see, I can call it forward because it starts in X on a forward arc and ends in Y on a forward uh, arc. So I say that this is an anti-directed trail from X to Y, and now we are interested in uh, seeing whether, well, what can we say about these things? Is it easy to check whether there is such a thing? Well, yes it is, uh, time is not long, but if you know anything about what's called, what I call the bipartite representation of a digraph, whenever you have a digraph, uh, you can make a bipartite graph like this. So these are all the tails of the arc, these are all the heads of the arc, so you can see the arc from three to two goes from three to two here. And it's easy to see that if you have an anti-directed path over here, this will be a path like this. So from one to two, to backward to three, forward to, to four, this exists over here. So you can now find these uh, pass here if you want. So you can easily check be, uh, for any two vertices x and y whether there's an anti to pass from x to y because then that means there has to be a pass from x plus to y minus in, in this one here. So this is nothing deep but very useful it turns out. So uh, <coughs> now we call a graph anti-strong if it has the property, a digraph anti-strong if it has the property that for all pairs x, y, there's an anti-directed trail from x to y. And as we just saw, this is something we can check in polynomial time. And the graph is, in fact, anti-strong if and only if its bipartite representation is a connected graph. So there are some simple things. We can check anti-strong connectivity in polynomial time. And there are also other relations. So basically, the main reason why I decided to present this talk here is that it has more to do uh, with connectivity than you can see from now. I mean, it's certainly Sounds like a very strange connectivity measure, but you will see other nice connectivity measures coming up soon. You already saw the bipartite graph being connected. It's related to this. So uh, we can extend this a little bit by saying that uh, the graph is k arc anti-strong. If you have k arc disjoint anti-directed trails from x to y, so, uh, so this, of course, we can uh, say this is immediately seen to be equivalent with uh, this bipartite representation to be k edge connected. And uh, this means that we can also check this part in, uh, in polynomial time. Also, we can say, we can see Nash-Williams theorem um, hiding in the, in the back because if I look at the bipartite graph, if the bipartite graph representation happens to be 2K edge connected, this means that it has K disjoint spanning trees and each spanning tree in the bipartite representation back in the digraph corresponds to an anti-strong spanning graph. So I can uh, easily see this, so, so far nothing very surprising. But also, we can also check uh, using matroid theory, of course, the union of matroids, whether we do have uh, this thing, so whether we, we have, a <coughs> I mean, this, this is a result, we can check for a given digraph uh, whether there are k artist-joint spanning anti-strong subgraphs and find them, or we can provide a certificate that they do not exist. This is clear. If you compare this to digraphs, I mean, I can, if I want anti-strong, I can check, uh, I have trouble with this thing, I can check any number uh, of anti-strong disjoint graphs, but for digraphs, it's NP-complete to decide if the digraphs have even two disjoint span, spanning subgraphs. So you, you want the strong spanning subgraphs. This, in fact, I can say is just a remark here that, in fact, this follows from the, uh, the fact that even for two regular digraphs, it's NP-complete to decide whether it, it has a Hamilton cycle. I mean, it, it, in fact, also if, if it has two edge disjoint Hamilton cycles. Okay, so instead... Uh, we, we want to now look at the, the core things that will lead us to, to the more interesting things on matroids. Namely, uh, we looked, study now these structures of arcs here, what we call CATS, closed anti-directed trail. 
So close anti-directed trail is simply uh, either an even thing like this, an even cycle, uh, anti-oriented, or you may intersect yourself several times, so you could go forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, and so on. You can see you can return like this. And if you study a given digraph and you look at the sets which are cat-free, so contain none of these, this is exactly a matroid on the arcs uh, graph. So for, for the Hungarian, this is just a, an extremely easy uh, re remark because uh, they already look at the matroid for the fiber side representation, and, and there it is. But uh, this matroid is somehow uh, nice, it's simple, and it can be, I don't have time here, it can be defined directly on the digraph. So you, it would be equivalent to the matroid in the fiber side representation, but you can define it also on, on the digraph. You can see it in, in the paper here. Okay, uh, <coughs> uh, so we can decide. Uh, now the, we come to this question, which leads to the problem I mentioned the other day. So uh, if you give me a digraph, well, I can easily find out whether it's anti-strong. I just look at the Biberside representation. Now the Biberside representation, if it's not connected, then the graph is not anti-strong, and I can now find easily the minimum number of new arcs to add in order to be anti-strong, because this is really just making the Biberside representation connected, using preserving bipartiteness. And this is easy uh, for, for k equal 1. But the problem that I posed uh, is exactly this one, so if just in disguise. I mean, here's a problem for digraphs. I have a digraph and a natural number k, can I find the minimum number of new arcs to add so that the digraph becomes k arc anti-strong? And again, that means that for every pair of vertices, x and y, I can k-color the arcs such that I have a red, let's say color 1, anti-directed trail from x to y, and a color 2, and so on, so for each of them. And this is uh, equivalent to the question that I posed. Uh, I didn't pose it quite correctly on the board, but maybe in the description I gave, I think it's correct. You have a bipartite graph with uh, bipartition x, y, and x, y, these are the two copies. If you look at the bipartite representation, you have two copies of the vertices, v, uh, x and y, or v prime, and, or minus and plus, as we had before. Why do I have a perfect matching? I have a perfect matching in a complement because uh, I'm not allowed to add a, a loop, say, on the, on the digraph. This would already be an anti-directed thing, so we don't want that. <coughs> Oops, and I want now to find the minimum number of, uh, of new arcs so that uh, the graph becomes anti-strong, which is the same as finding the minimum number of new edges adding across the bipartition who, uh, who makes a graph k exponential. And this is the augmentation problem that may be of some interest. I think. At least it doesn't seem easily solved by the method I know. Okay, so now let's come to the deeper things. So these are all mainly just uh, observations about anti-strong. So here uh, is the more interesting part, namely, now the input is an undirected graph, and I would like to know, can I orient the edges of this undirected graph in such a way that I obtain a digraph which is anti-strong? <coughs> uh, and here, it turns out to be the key observation here is to study subsets of size at most 2k, uh, 2n minus 1 first, and find out whether I can orient them to be independent in this matrix. So this is the key observation. Uh, so this is what, what we, uh, we did. This is m one of the main, two main results. So we were able to say exactly when you have such a set of, of uh, edges here, when can you orient it so it is cat-free? So uh, of course now we are moving fast, time is slow. So, but suppose I have a set of edges of size exactly 2v minus 1. If I can orient that without having any closed anti-directed trail, that's equivalent to saying that the bipartite representation is connected. So, but now I don't have I don't have the bipartite graph in the beginning. In fact, for every pair of vertices, I don't know whether I will take this edge or that edge. I have to decide that. So this is a this is a thing. So it's not an easy problem at all. But it turns out that uh, we can we can characterize this nicely. And uh, those of you who know matroid theory will see that these conditions are uh, close. They look very close to what uh, rigidity say. Here, there would be a minus three here. So we claim that uh, <coughs> the graph with uh, not too many edges because the matroid cannot have ranked more than 2v minus 1, will have such an orientation if and only if whenever I look at a subset, I never have more than two sides of the subset minus one edges inside. And if the graph is bipartite, in, if the graph induced by this is bipartite, then in fact I have to have one less arc here. And uh, it's not difficult to see that these conditions are necessary because if I had a set, so first of all, the first observation is that if you look at a bipartite digraph, that can never be anti-strong because I can never have a forward arc starting on the, say, the, uh, the right side or whatever side you want to look at this, and then 
move to a, a vertex on the, on the same side here because this path will always be odd with the S there. So this, this cannot be anti score. Also, if you look at condition one, if I had more edges like this inside here, you look at the privatized representation of the graph that I get here, it will contain a cycle, and that cycle will give you a path in the, in the diagram. So these are necessary conditions. And uh, it can be shown, or I'll just sketch very briefly the other way. So now we introduce uh, first a new notion. A graph is an odd pseudo-forest. If uh, it's not really a tree, but whenever I have a cycle in a component, I have precisely one cycle, and the cycle is odd. So then we call it an odd pseudo-forest. And we claim the following, which is uh, part of the proof, that if you satisfy these two conditions, you have this uh, at most two sides of the uh, subgraph minus one edges inside, and if it's bipartite, one less. <laughs> then this happens if and only if you can split, you can two-color the edges, so one of the colors uh, is a forest, and the other one is an odd pseudo forest. Second claim is that if you have a graph that is such an edge union of these two guys, then you can orient it in a good way. And uh, let's do the last thing first. The last thing, uh, now when I present it, I hope I can convince you that it works and that it looks fairly easy. And I, I will tell you, it was not easy to find this way of doing it. So you, you should imagine that this is a proof that for every graph which is a union of some forest and an odd pseudo forest, then you can get such an orientation. So I will show you a way of getting the orientation. And <coughs> here I assume that I have the maximum number of edges, namely two uh, n minus one. This turns out to be the hardest one. So I'm looking now at something which is a union of a tree, which I'm not showing. And then this odd soda forest. Why is it an odd soda forest? Well, it's an odd, you can even call it a soda tree because it's spanning, it's connected, and there's exactly one cycle, and it's an odd cycle. So you orient the tree, all edges of the tree going down. So what, what does it really mean? I mean, you give me a spanning tree, and that spanning tree is bipartite, of course. So I take a bipartition of this, or the bipartition of this, and now I look at these other edges. Where are they? Some go between the bipartite sets, some are inside at the top, some are inside at the bottom. Those edges that are between the bipartite sets of this tree, I orient in the opposite direction. And the other ones, how do I orient those? Well, I first observe that because I have an odd cycle here, at least one edge of that odd cycle is going to be inside a bipartition class. Otherwise, it would be even. So I, I fix vertex, special vertex here. And now I make this orientation. I first delete this. And then I make the orientation of the remaining arcs like this. And uh, it looks uh, more or less arbitrary, but it's not, because what I do is up here, in this layer here, I sort of look at the path from R to this vertex, say, uh, maybe this, this vertex here is more interesting. The path from R to this vertex will go like this, so I'm moving the orientation away from R, so I sort of point away from R in that way, and down here, look, look at this vertex here, the path from R, this is, a, you see, this is a tree, the path from R here, when I go down, I'm now, down here, I'm going towards the, the R, and here I'm going away from R. And if you do that, it works. And just one very short remark why it can work. Look here. <coughs> this, this, remember, this is an odd soda forest. So it's either just an odd cycle or there will be some leaves hanging out here. And if you look, say, at this leaf here, all the edges from the tree go down. And this has exactly one arc out of it in, uh, in the whole graph. But then this vertex here cannot be in, an, in a soda forest because it can certainly, this arc here, sorry, the vertex may be, but the arc cannot be because when you are in, you have, you have two arcs out or two arcs in. So this, this particular arc here is useless. I can delete it. And I can continue to delete all the arcs until I have deleted all the arcs of this thing here. And none of them, all, all, until I read the cycle, and none of them can be in, in, a, in a cat. So after those are deleted, I look at this arc here. If I orient this, this, I should have done that before. This arc here is oriented exactly such a way that this also has that property. You see, there may be many, many arcs coming out here, but the only arc that goes uh, into this vertex R is this red arc. So that can also not be here. And that means I could argue that for every, every arc over here, none of the arcs can be in a cat. But here, there's, there's no cat because this, this guy contains no cycle. So then the orientation is cat free. And, and what does that mean? It means that the, uh, the rank of the set in the matroid is the full, full rank for the matroid. <coughs> OK, and here, uh, maybe this, uh, this time of day is not really so nice to see. But this proving that this is, uh, 
that this, if you satisfy this condition, then you can be split like this. This is a matroid thing. So you have basically two matroids. One matroid is the forest matroid or the circuit matroid, and the other one is uh, the uh, either called even or odd by circular. I guess it has a name, uh, matroid that will, uh, will 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 do the other parts. And this follows basically from uh, from various results in matroid theory, namely the first one. If you have a if you have a submodular function here, if you define independence as being size at most uh, the the size of a set is at most the, the function on the set, then this is a matroid that's well known. And uh, so then one example, if I define the function to be, for every edge set, I simply uh, pick up the number of vertices that are incident with the edges. This is the circuit matrix. You can see this is just another way of describing the circuit matrix. The another one is uh, this that comes from this even by circular matrix, where I have now, I have to subtract one. Uh, I have to subtract one for each bipartite component. So I have a, if I look at a set of edges, I look at uh, the bipartite components and I subtract one. I'm not allowed to have so many edges there. So this is also a matroid that's known. And what we're looking at is exactly this submodular function here, namely that it's a sum of these two. And uh, a set is independent if and only if it satisfies both of these. So it turns out that this, the matroid you get here is exactly the matroid union of these two matroids here. This requires uh, a theorem, a proof, but this follows from a result, a fairly recent result by uh, Cato and Takenawa, namely that uh, you actually have the matroid union of these two guys are easy equal to this, if and only if the minimum in the rank function is assumed for the same partition for all of these things. And in this case, uh, it can be shown that the minimum that we get is on the set of connected components of the edges here. Yeah, but some, something is independent here. If you, uh, you may have a cycle, but then it has to be odd. You can have in, inside a component, a connected component, you may have exactly one cycle, and then it has to be odd. So this is this. Okay, so anyway, the, the gist of it is that this is a matroid, and the matroid that we are studying, the one that ch tells you whether a set of edges is, can, can be oriented cat-free, is the matroid union of two matroids uh, that we uh, more or less know. This one we know very well, and this one I didn't know before we did this paper, but then now I know it. Okay, so the next question you can ask, so, so what we did now is we characterize what sets of arcs of size at most 2 n minus 1 can be independent in this matroid. Now if I have a graph which has more edges than 2 n minus 1, I am going to get a cat no matter what I do. This is clear. But now the problem, the question is, can I orient it in such a way that I do get a cat-free set of size 2 n minus 1. That means that means that the bipartite representation will be connected. And uh, this is possible if and only if you can derive this. This is not a direct consequence, of course. Whenever you look at a partition, look again, you, you, you look at some partition. So forget about this for a second. This is exactly saying that you, uh, you have a spanning tree in there because whenever you partition, you need uh, the number of edges you need is at least the number of sets minus 1. But here, you need one more because whenever you have something which is bipartite, you need to stick an extra edge in there to help uh, picking up some of the vertices in the edges form. And then uh, I want to really say something more. Uh, uh, I, I do have 10 minutes, I guess, unless I don't. <laughs> but because let's just look at this thing here. What does it say? The fact that it, uh, what we're looking at is the union of two matrices means that we can actually, for a given graph, decide whether there is such an orientation in polynomial time. We use the matroid uh, union, matroid partition, or whatever you call it. One day I call it union, one day partition. You can use that algorithm to produce the partition into a forest and an odd uh, photo forest. And then we use our orientation trick to find the orientation. And now we know that uh, we have a good orientation. <coughs> and and then, then what about all the remaining edges? Well, we just orient them arbitrarily. This is fine. Now, the consequences are the following. If you have a four edge connected non bipartite graph, it already has an anti strong orientation. And something which is more than this, but not exactly the same. If you have three SSR and spanning trees and you're non-bipartite, you also have an anti-strong orientation. And the reason for this is, uh, well, I mean, you, you just, one of the trees you only use to say that, that, that these three trees do not have the same bipartition. I mean, otherwise the graph is bipartite. Or we can find three spanning trees that do not all have the same bipartition because the graph is non-bipartite. So one tree, fix one tree, take an edge from one of the other trees so that adding that edge to the first tree gives you an odd cycle. Now you have one thing and you have the other thing, you do the orientation and you're done. So this is nice. 
Now look here, this is the, what I found was, was quite nice, that this has something to do with a completely different looking topic, namely detachments. So uh, what is a two detachment? You know, uh, as William studied detachment, you have a vertex. Uh, you want to split this vertex, you have some number here, maybe five. You have to split the vertex in five copies, and then you but, uh, distribute the edges incident to the original vertex, and you ask some question, can I do this in such a way that graph is connected or whatever. So two detachment, for every vertex, you have specified exactly two vertices. You split in a V prime, or a V plus, and a V minus, and you distribute the edges. So if you have one edge, there are four possible places you can put it, V minus, U plus, U plus, U V minus, and so on. And, and you do can take exactly one of those. And now here is uh, <coughs> an easy equivalence due to this bipartite representation, that a graph has an anti-strong orientation if and only if you can two detach the graph into a connected graph, which is bipartite, using exactly the detachment sets as a bipartition. So this, uh, so this, this thing here, you could also have asked the other question without talking about anti strong or force. I, I give you a graph. Is there a two detachment of this graph so that the graph is uh, bipartite and connected, and the bipartition has to be these sets here? And this now is answered by our work here, and we get exactly this characterization. You can do this two detachment if and only if you satisfy the condition I described before. Okay, uh, so just a few more remarks uh, and, uh, and then I will be done. So uh, some time ago with uh, Anas Yeo, I proved that uh, it's NP-complete to decide for a die graph whether you can find a spanning strong top graph and remove so that the, the graph that remains is connected in the underlying sense. So you remove some edges and you would like to have, uh, so another way of saying it is, if I want to decide whether I can two-color the edges of a digraph, one and two, so that one is a strong spanning graph and two is a connected, has a spanning tree in the underlying sense. This is NP-complete. But if we replace strong by anti-strong, then we get a polynomial problem, namely the following. If I now have a digraph and I would like to know whether I can two-color so that the first color is anti-strong and spanning and the second color is connected, this is polynomial because of the matrix that are behind it. So you just use the matrix and then you, you can do it. Okay. <coughs> so what about this question here, which I think could be some, of some interest. So is it possible to decide whether a digraph contains two, I mean you can two color the edges of a digraph again, so that one part is anti-strong and spanning and the other one is strongly connected and spanning. And, uh, <coughs> Yes, this is just underlying, underlying connectivity here. So, so this, this question here, and, and why could it be an interesting question? Well, because strong and anti-strong are very far from each other. I mean, being strong, you can also see, I mean, anti-strong, I'm allowed to go as I want. You can have arbitrarily high anti-strong connectivity and not being strongly connected, and the converse. But maybe we could still decide whether we can split such a graph. And we know that uh, for the, uh, for two, if I want strong and strong, then it's NP-complete, this is what we just said. And you could also intermediately, uh, instead of being strongly connected here, say, is it possible to at least extract an anti-strong spanning graph and a two-edge connected in the underlying sense? Yeah, of course, if you're strong, then you are two-edge connected in the underlying graph. And we conjecture the following, that uh, if you have <laughs> extremely high connectivity to this, uh, so you have both very high connectivity and you have very high anti-strong connectivity, then maybe you can extract two strong spanning top digraphs. So it's a conjecture of Anas Yeo and myself that even the first thing is enough, but this is somehow a relaxation of this thing. Now we are at the last slide, so I will keep my time, don't worry. Now you could ask this question, which I, I guess is difficult, but maybe the matrix theory people will be able to tell me immediately. Now suppose, uh, unfortunately I had one and two in the other thing, this is a union of two sets of slides. So here was this condition that no more than two sides of H minus one and two sides of h minus two. Suppose I satisfy these conditions. Now I know that I can split these guys into a forest and an odd soda forest. But suppose I would now want to do it in such a way that the odd soda forest, which is by the way not really correctly spelled, has as few components as possible. So is there a way to, there may be many, many ways of splitting these. Is there a way to sort of get as few components as possible there? Because I think that could be useful. I don't really know how to do it. Uh, <coughs> so this is maybe some, somehow a question uh, based on the matroid part because if you, you like 
one set in the matroid, uh, I guess the matroid doesn't really care whether I have five odd cycles or I have only one odd cycle, but, uh, but maybe there's something else that could be used there. And here's the last question, which I think is, uh, could be challenging. Now, suppose I have an underrated graph, and I would like to know whether I can orient it so at the same time it's strong and anti-strong. So this, uh, this is, is clearly OK if the graph has many SS joint spanning trees, because uh, we saw that if you have uh, three SS joint spanning trees and you're not bipartite, then you can always do it. So if you had, say, five SS joint spanning trees, then you use two of them to do the strong orientation and the other one. So you, this is something that's possible if you just have high enough connectivity. But this doesn't help us here, I guess, to, to solve this. And this is enough. Thank you. I can what? Yes, in Metro, the uh, partition, but that's the same, I guess. Yes, yes. So, in a, I mean, is the same as the look at the uh, two parts of the representation of that? I mean, if you want to know the empty access, can you represent which trees, where the access cross trees? Uh, yes, you have a cross. You have to decide which cross you want, which one of the two is. Yeah. If you can, yes, probably you can find that. So we just we, we found a constructed way of doing it. But you say you might be able to do it uh, just using these matroids. So on. It's just using the type of representation mm -hmm. orientation. It's just using the orientation of that. Yes. Actually, the only way is there's no type of the type of representation. Yes. So you can go with the best of all orientation. Independent in that. Yes, yes, yes. The other thing is, I mean, we've not talked about the Oriental interaction. Mm -hmm. Anyone know Oriental Oriental interaction just means that you've got two options. You could find yes, that yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's just the type you want it to be. Yes. So it seems like this is one way to do a smooth edge in a simple way to make smooth edge. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, there's no doubt. I mean, we, we have an algorithm uh, to do it uh, just by, which I, I personally like better because I can see the drawing. But and it, uh, it also works for the other thing. This, this, is, this was merely to prove that it works, I mean, that you can do it. So, yes. But Yes, in fact, I mean, some people may also say this was not a talk on the right graph. I mean, what did you do? You really spoke on this bipartite graph, which is in some sense true. But I think that you can still ask nice questions about directed the part here if you have this. No, what I'm saying is that, that the anti-strong orientation that I'm working is really a question about the bipartite representation, like you say, but you have these. Yes, yes. So. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if the graph is not bipartite, so if the graph is bipartite, you cannot do it. So you, it, you may be one trillion connected and you cannot do it. So bipartite graphs have no chance of having this. So the graph is non-bipartite. And then you, can, you, then you can find, if it has many spanning trees, you can find spanning trees that, are, that do not form a bipartite graph. So. But you, can, you probably don't need so there is many, but I mean the question here is, is the algorithmic one. It's not a, it's not a sufficient connectivity condition. How do I turn this off? <laughs> so we don't.